It's the first Prez Monday check-in. We'll have a chat, but not spill tea. Hey, it's the first Prez Monday check-in. We got the Bible and Greg and me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Monday check-in on a Thursday. Because why not? Uh, because why not? That, that seems yeah. reasonable. Exactly. So there you go. Uh, and also because, Greg, you and I were out of town on Monday and Tuesday, and uh, yesterday was Wednesday. We were still out of town on part of Wednesday morning, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Yep, we were. So. Yeah. So it's a Monday check-in on a Thursday this week. My name, for those who may not know, is Damon Jensen Heitman. I'm one of the pastors at First Presbyterian Church of Hastings, Nebraska, joined by... Greg Allen Pickett, the other pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Hastings, Nebraska, and still recovering from that travel. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, and uh, there there were flight delays, there were... um, car rental uh, things uh, um, yeah it was a, it was not quite a planes trains and automobiles situation uh, but it, <laughs> it wasn't far off I don't suppose we did ride on a plane a train and an automobile if we count the train in the Denver airport yeah that's true yeah but uh, we weren't trying to sell shower curtain holders or what what is it that he sells in that movie he's uh, a shower i think he sells the things that hold the shower curtain onto the rod like shower curtain rings yeah i think that's okay i think that's what he sells i don't know somebody will tell me maybe if anybody listens to this <laughs> Uh, the Monday check-in, for those who don't know, is uh, we take a look at at least some of the scripture that we're going to use for the upcoming Sunday, which in this case is just a few days away, and uh, have a little chat about some of the themes that we see in it, uh, some of the questions that we have of it, perhaps some of the questions that we see this passage having of us, and and have a little little study uh, in that way. And then we switch gears a little bit and talk about life of the church at First Pres Hastings. So, and we begin with a word of prayer. May I offer the opening prayer, Greg? Take it away. Loving and gracious God, thank you for the way that your spirit moves. Thank you for the many, many ways that your spirit connects to us in our daily lives. Thank you for the opportunity to return to your word time and time again uh, to seek out the wisdom that uh, can be found in it, the wisdom that can be found in our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, the wisdom that can be found in you. In your gracious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this upcoming Sunday, um, let's see, this would be the fourth Sunday in Easter? Fourth, yes. Yeah, something like that. I believe and so. Yeah, we're going, yes. we're going, we're going John Heavy. Well, and we're also going backwards. So this is generally a lectionary-based Bible study. And uh, the gospel reading that we're doing was actually the gospel reading for last week, because last week uh, I ended up preaching on the Acts passage, And I loved the gospel reading from last week. And I thought, I can't let a year go by that I don't preach on uh, John 21. And so, um, so I've, I've transported John 21 from the third Sunday of Easter to the fourth Sunday of Easter. It is settling in there. It seems to be really comfortable for it uh, and for me. And so we are going to go from there. (laughs) I like it. It makes sense to me. And, and also, we have, yeah, we have a a non liturgical, non religious holiday this Sunday. Um, that I think thematically is about love. Uh, it is not Valentine's Day, but I think it still uh, has a lot to do with love and showing love and appreciation for those who love us, 
And so we have a couple of passages that uh, that help us think about what does it mean to love. Mm-hmm. As yeah. we, yeah, yeah. Some have said that love is all you need. I don't think that's true. Even if you have a fun instrumental riff right after you make that statement, yeah. Is it love plus the da 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 da? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. All you the, need? <laughs> um, well, I guess I don't know their their thoughts on that in particular, but uh, I don't I don't think that's true. I but. do know that Damon Jensen Heitman's father in law is probably the biggest Beatles fan that I know in my life and sphere of influence in the world. Sure. But it may be an example of why we may not want to look to pop culture for all of our wisdom. Indeed. <laughs> certainly parts, you know, yeah. certainly the, you know, snippets of wisdom uh, in pop culture, but uh, also not, not all of it is, uh, is found there. <laughs> uh, so we got, we got John, we got first John and then the gospel of John. Um. Uh, uh, first John, which there's no second John. There must be a second John somewhere else. No, well, there's a second John. There's a third John. Oh John. yeah, there is. Yeah, there's John. Yeah, first, second, third. One. Yeah, I forgot the song. Yeah, for a little bit. First John, um, second John, third. Uh, three John, Jude, and Revelation. That's. That's how the lyric goes. But at any rate, um, uh, so, okay, so First John, uh, an epistle, a letter um, written to believers, um, not necessarily written to believers in a particular place in the way that uh, Paul's letters um, are. And uh, so First John, not written by the disciple, John or the apostle, um, but most likely written by those following John's teachings and interpretations, like those sort of continuing the uh, the way of John. <laughs> I suppose they were like um, like Presbyterians, right? It's kind of like a denomination. Like they don't believe in John. Uh, yeah, I see, right? I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. They believe in Jesus. Yeah. But they really like the way that John thinks about Jesus. It and like resonates. The, yes. With the way that John thinks and talks about Jesus. And so they uh, yeah. find his words to be the clearest ones for them and their understanding of the triune mm-hmm. God. Yes. Yeah. That's what it's like. They're, they're Johannine. Uh, they're kind of like a, like a denomination kind of, of sorts. If that yeah. is helpful to people to, to think about it's a community of folks that, uh, yeah, found this sort of way of, of interpreting and this emphasis of belief, uh, or living out the faith, uh, to be meaningful to them, I suppose. So, um, So, but it goes like this. Uh, This is from the fourth chapter. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must 
love their brothers and sisters also. Uh, and that's that reading from 1 John. And then from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19, this is uh, a resurrection. Oh, hmm? It's a long reading. Well, yeah, it's from John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not Mark that we're dealing with here. Um, yeah, so, uh, so and this is a resurrection appearance um, of Jesus. That would, that would probably become obvious, but maybe not. Um, so it seemed like an important thing to add in. So a post-resurrection uh, appearance of Jesus. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, John 21. Uh, After these things, Joseph, uh, I almost said Joseph. I tried to combine Jesus and Joseph and maybe also Joshua into one name. So that was fun. Which uh, Jesus and Joshua are like written the same way, Uh, but that's fine. Uh, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fashion your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fashion a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Here ends this reading as well. Greg, what do you got? a lot going on in both of these readings um mm-hmm. going back to first john i was i was thinking about um and i was going to do an illustration here on my desk which none of you can see so um but so oh, we can have, do you want should it can we you want a screen share no 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 no. I, I oh don't it's just out of camera site this is this okay is just me so you have humanity this is us right the pen and first john 4 7 through 21 we have God represented by my coffee mug. And it talks about the relationship of the love between God and between humanity, right? A two-way street, how we as humanity are called to love God, but 
that's because God first loved us. And then, let's see. And then we have uh, the rest of humanity over here represented by this coaster. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then this also instructs us that we receive this love from God to us, and then we are called to share this love with others, right? And so there's, there's a lot of love transfiguring or moving around in this passage, right? Love from God to humanity, love from humanity to God, and then love from Christians, believers to the rest of humanity. And I think it's important that, that we recognize that all of this is going on grounded in the fact that we love because God first loved us. But then if we say that we love God and don't love others, then we are not living at all the way of Jesus. Um, and so God loves us. We, we love God, but we also love others. And these are all absolutely fundamentally important parts of what it means to, to follow Jesus. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's just, it, it, I was, I, I see a slide that I, probably won't make with arrows and directions and things. Um, but anyways, that, that, that's what struck me when I read this first John four passage It's just, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's a, it's a, it's a transient property kind of a thing. Mm. Um, right. Yes. I th I th and I think, I think that that like those verses, you know, verse 20, uh, those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars <laughs> for the, uh, for those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And it, 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 if you can't love the people that, you know, um, then how can you love this God that is uh, effectively mystery? Um, Right. So many times, it's probably sometimes easier actually to love mystery because, to some extent, you can kind of think that you can fill the mystery in however you would like. Um, you can't really do that so well with a with a particularity, I suppose. But, Meaning another human being, right? Because the other human being is there in front of you with all of their quirks and warts and yeah. and lovely things as well. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And all the things that you've just decided that you don't like, um, or that you don't agree with or yeah, whatever the case may be. Um, but I think in a, in a, in a hyper critical day and age, like this sort of correction, I think is really important. This idea you can't, <laughs> You can't say that you love God and then turn around and um, just and bash people on social media or um, or not even just like around your dinner table, right? <laughs> um, I mean, people pick up this sort of stuff from all sorts of places, but yeah. yeah. There's a really lovely quote from Dorothy Day, who was a, a Catholic uh, social worker. And uh, I say really lovely quote. It's actually a very convicting quote, but it's simple. And she said, you only love God as much as you love the person you love the least. Yeah. And so you think, think about a landscape of your life and the person that you have perhaps said that you hate or the person that you just can't seem to love and you think the person's unlovable as much as you love that unlovable person that's that's how much you can love god and and this first john 4 passage i mean it basically dorothy day has has summarized the entirety of this first john 4 7 21 passage you only love god as much as you love the person you love the least and and that's it holy cow is that convicting because mm -hmm. when i sort of pan back and think about the landscape of people i know in my life and people who cause me frustration or sadness or whatever. And I think, okay, how much do I really love that person? That's how much I love God. And whoa, that's a reorientation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it can, it's, it's interesting because I think it can be 
I think it can be convicting in that sort of way. I think it can also be like a, like a helpful hint, <laughs> um, you know, uh, and a way of sort of uh, sorting out who's being honest about the faith and who is um, uh, not, I, I suppose. Right. So uh, if you hear someone claiming the faith or, or you, or, you know, kind of using the faith as as a way of sort of i don't know scoring points with others or or whatever the case might be and then you also hear them saying hateful things about people like that that could that should be like <laughs> um that should be could be an indicator to you of how seriously you might want to take this person uh yeah i i i've been well, there was a there was a Supreme Court case, um, and I probably shouldn't be wading into this water, but I'm I'm going to um, about a, a high school football coach who goes and prays on the 50 yard line after uh, a football game, and um, and I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that, except when it causes other students who feel compelled that they have to go pray with him, and that's that's why the Supreme Court will decide this in terms of how does it work constitutionally. From the sake of our faith, though, I am less concerned about a public display of faith like going and kneeling on the 50-yard line and more concerned about how that coach treats his, treats his players before and after the game and how that coach treats his family and how that coach engages with people in his community who he may fundamentally disagree with. That, to me, would be of a greater concern to me as a pastor than whether he does or doesn't kneel on the 50-yard line following a football game, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. nothing wrong with praying, uh, no. at all, but show me how you're loving your brother or sister. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and how are you, how are you treating the opposing, the, op the opposing team? And how are you teaching your team to treat the opposing team? Right. Mm -hmm. These are the things I would like to see how that looks and to me that's a greater indication of a faithfulness to the way of jesus necessarily than going and kneeling on the 50 yard line where everyone can see you to pray and actually the gospel of matthew um tells us that we we should pray privately and so i i, I would love i would love to actually sit down and have a conversation with that football coach and, and understand from him how he reconciles that admonition um, in the Gospel of Matthew, to to pray privately, not to do it publicly, as as the Pharisees do, where they right like there's yeah. there's, a, there's a very very clear indication there, and so I, I'd I'd love to have a conversation with him about that and understand how he reconciles those things and and that sort of thing, but ultimately, I don't have a problem with the guy praying, um, but I would like to know how is he living his life, how is he loving his brothers and sisters, how is he teaching his football team to love their opponents and their brothers and sisters that's to me the harder work than um and 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 the more gospel centric work uh than going out and just kneeling on the 50 yard line yeah yeah and which probably i'll say entirely possible that that coach uh, does behave in, a, in an upright uh, manner and all you know does treat every one of his players and assistant coaches with respect and dignity and love and generosity and kindness and and does extend the same thing um to the opponents as well so yeah and i also yes. and i and i also wouldn't have a problem with anybody else heading to the 50 yard line and offering a prayer of any other faith tradition um as well so, um, should uh, should shift over to the to the gospel. Yeah, so there's we, a lot there as well, and I know yeah. this is like one of your personal favorite. Well, yeah, and and keeping with the theme of, of I mean, there's a, there's a ton to unpack here, but keeping with the theme of love, right? You have Jesus questioning Simon Peter, "Do you love me?" and Simon Peter says, yes, of course, you know, I love you, Jesus. And Jesus said, well, then go feed my lambs. 
right? So loving me looks like loving others. That's how, yeah. and so that's that's why to me this first John passage and this gospel of John passage so beautifully sort of align because what Jesus is saying to Peter over and over again is, if you love me, go love others, take care of others. That is what it means. That's how you show that you love me, right? Um, and of course, there's a structure in here where Jesus asks him three times, which is probably designed to parallel the structure of Peter denying Jesus three times. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Jesus was subtly reminding Peter of uh, that moment of weakness just a few weeks ago uh, by asking him three times. And, and we read that, that, that Peter became exasperated that Jesus kept asking him the same question. And I wonder, was Jesus exasperated that Peter denied him three times? <laughs> um, but, but at the end of the day, Jesus stuck with Peter. And so there's, there's, there's some hope in there. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, Peter stuck with following the way of Christ. And, and we read in the Acts of the Apostles that Peter goes on to really help um, teach others about Jesus and teach others the way of Jesus. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of hope in here for me that, yeah, despite our human fallibility, which Peter so often displays, uh, we, we are still able to be instruments of God's love in the world. We are still able to love God and to show our love of God or Jesus by feeding the lambs, tending the sheep and following Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, this passage is very much focused or revolves around this idea of this is this, uh, one of the last things that's described as happening in the gospel of John, right? I mean, this is, this is right at the end of the gospel and this passage in part revolves around this. Like, how are you, how are these disciples now becoming apostles and how are they going to, how are they going to carry out and continue the faith? Right. So we have this, um, you know, you, the, the putting out your nets um, and, and having a catch, even though you've been unsuccessful, that's um, a story that has happened before and it happens again. I don't, I don't know. There's interesting details in here that I, um, that I don't really quite understand. I don't know why he's naked on on the boat like were they all naked <laughs> was it just him it was like he didn't want to get his clothes wet but while he was fishing but then he put clothes on to jump in the water <laughs> uh, like that there's a theological thing there i think right that seems kind of adam and eve to me and all of a sudden they realized they were naked in the garden, uh, in the presence of God, um, and and that sort of a thing, which is which is interesting. I'll, I'll go ahead. Yeah, I'll just backing up a little further. Just the the beginning in in verse three. Simon Peter said to these other disciples, "I'm going fishing," mm -hmm. and they said, "We will go with you." Like they, Jesus has died. He's appeared to them twice in post-resurrection appearances, but they're still not entirely convinced that this thing is, is going to happen. And so they return to what they know, right? They return home and they return to what they know. I'm going fishing. We will go with you. Um, and then Jesus astounds them, uh, reminding them once again of what this is all about. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the, they're not able to haul the catch in because there's so many fish. But later in the passage, Jesus says, hey, bring some of the fish that you just caught. And Simon Peter goes to the board and then he just hauls the whole net out seemingly by himself. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what's happening there. And I find it's interesting. Jesus is there on shore. He's got a fire going uh, and there's already fish on it. It says, they saw a charcoal fire, fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you have just caught to like add to this little. But I, th I just find it's interesting that I don't know what to do with it. 
<laughs> or if there's anything really to do with it. But Jesus already has fish. He's already got the meal going. And he's asking these disciples now, like, you just need to add to this. Because, like, there's already stuff here. Um, but why don't you bring what you got and add to it as well? But and, and then again, displaying hospitality, right? Jesus is once again modeling for them. What does it look like to follow him? Well, there he is on the shore and he's already cooked them breakfast and he invites them to sit down and eat with them. Um, yeah, he's got bread. I was, maybe he bought the bread someplace or maybe he baked it himself. I don't know. But yeah. Um, and the bread is, of course, a, a reminder of the, the last meal that they shared with one another. Right, and John uh, even writes the line, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. I mean, clearly, we're echoing the mm-hmm. Last Supper. But we're, I think we're also echoing, echoing the miracle of loaves and fishes, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jesus is, there's, there's a miraculous presence of fish that wasn't there before Jesus showed up. And so um, Jesus is reminding them of, of abundance as well, that this, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the and the nets don't break, uh, which is good. You don't, you don't want your nets to break, I suppose. Um, yeah, I didn't, yeah, it's a uh, as often happens, and the, there's lots of little interesting details in in the Gospel of John, uh, many of which are there for kind of really specific. They serve specific theological purposes, uh, whether they're there for that or not. I, I don't know, but um, but yeah. So I don't know what else. You think it'll preach? I, I probably. Yeah. yeah. Very truly. Eighteen and nineteen are weird little verses. But. <laughs> yeah, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt. Yeah, that, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure what to do with that. I might just skim over that a little bit mm-hmm. yeah but the but the end of 19 after this he said to him follow me follow me yep. yeah okay uh is, is it time to change gears yeah let's talk about what's going on in the life of our church okay what would you like to talk about first well uh we're running our school year schedule, which uh, means we have an 8.30 uh, contemplative to Zay style service, uh, followed by a 10.30 uh, more traditional service in our sanctuary. The 8.30 service is in the chapel, 10.30 service is in the sanctuary. And uh, that will continue through May 22nd. So we have three more weeks of uh, the 8.30 service in the chapel and 10.30 service in the sanctuary. The following week is May 29th, which is Memorial Day. And so we're going to skip the 830 service because we think Uh, it's Memorial Day weekend. Correct. Um, Thank you. Yes. Memorial Day weekend. Um, But we will have a guest preacher on Memorial Day weekend. uh, The president of the Omaha Presbyterian Seminary Foundation. For those of you um, paying attention to these things, we had the president of the Omaha Presbyterian Seminary Foundation come and preach to us back in I think it was 2019. No, 2018. We had him come preach to us in 2018, fall of 2018. Uh, That president has retired and now there's a new president. And so Shelly, Reverend Shelly Latham will be joining us and will be preaching for us on May 29th, where we'll have just one service in the sanctuary. Hopefully you guys have gotten your pens and pencils out because I'm about to run through no, I don't know that I need to run through all of it. No, but before you do that, before we talk about summer schedule, I also want to, um, so this coming Sunday is the last day of Sunday school for the year. It's also the last day for forum for the year as well. And I want to put in another plug for Dr. Dorothy Dean, uh, who has been leading a three-part series Uh, forum for us taking a look at the intersection between ecology and theology and um, you know how has the church related to the natural world in the past how has that been helpful how has that been hurtful how might the church want to relate to the natural world 
moving forward. And so, and she wraps up that, that series this coming Sunday, that's at 9.15 in the Lydia room, which is uh, just down the hall from the offices. Uh, her previous two conversations have been recorded. Uh, one is up on YouTube. The other one should be up on YouTube by today. So if folks are interested in checking that out, uh, the most recent one uh, was Theology and Animals. I was doing confirmation things um, during that hour, but I'm, I'm really interested to give that a listen today while I um, do a little bit of editing and that sort of stuff and get it posted. So um, so just another, and there's, you don't like, if you weren't at the first two, you can come to the third. They don't really necessarily they're related to one another, but they don't necessarily stack uh, yeah. on one another. So, and uh, speaking of things going on in church too, so this this Sunday, uh, May eighth, will be the last Sunday of Sunday school, and then the following Wednesday will be our final Wednesday night live, Wednesday, May eleventh. And typically for our final Wednesday night live, we do a picnic in the park, and we will be doing that in uh, Libs Park, weather permitting, on Wednesday, May eleventh. I believe, if I'm not mistaken. The chancel choir will also be doing a closing year potluck dinner thing. And I think that's going to be here at the church in the fellowship hall. And so um, that promises to be a wonderful day, Wednesday, May 11th. Uh, and yeah. Then, yeah. yeah, the the school year is coming to an end. Uh, what we often think of as the program year uh, is coming to an end but we still have lots of interesting things happening uh, this summer. So we'll kind of switch over to summer schedule relatively soon. Yes. We're very excited for June. So stay tuned, but we got special music every Sunday in June. We have a jazz combo. We have a bluegrass band and we have a folk band and they're going to be helping us lead worship uh, throughout Sunday. But the first Sunday in June, mark your calendars. Don't want to miss this Sunday, June 5th, Pentecost in the park. We're going over to Brickway, uh, Brickyard Park. Brickyard? Brickyard. Brick, Bricky Park. <laughs> and at Brickway Brickyard Park, Yard Park. We're going to have a blowout Pentecost service that will include uh, three or four churches. And uh, it'll be amazing. So you don't want to miss that. And that's on Sunday, June 5th. Yeah. And the rest of the summer, we'll have summer sermon song series. We'll come back. Uh, we'll do some children's books uh, as well during the summer as well. So folks can uh, can be on the lookout for, for more information and, and some unique worship um, opportunities and during the course of the summer. So uh, what else? Anything else? And I think that's all we've got. Okay. Uh, would you please, Greg, close us with a word of prayer? I'd love to. Let's uh, let's pray. Gracious God, we read about love in these passages this morning, uh, the way that you love us, the way that we love you, and also the way that you call us to love others. And so as this week progresses, remind us of the call to love that you've placed on our hearts. Remind us of your love for us. May that provide us reassurance and hope. Remind us of our call to love you and remind us that the way that we do that is by loving and caring for others. And so may we be inspired by the words about love that we read in your Holy Scripture. And may we also be challenged to seek to love uh, one another, to seek to love our neighbors and our strangers, and even those that we might perceive as the difficult or challenging or unlovable among us uh, remind us, God, that there is no such thing in your realm, in your kingdom, that everybody is, uh, is a recipient of your love, God, and we in turn should also seek to love everybody. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, then with all those things said and done, until next time, toodaloo.